As a passenger, you don't expect your plane to run out of fuel mid-flight. It sounds like a horrifying scenario, especially when that plane is out over water, just out of reach of an airport. That was the reality for the passengers and crew on board Tuninta Flight 1153. The answer as to why this modern passenger plane ran out of fuel lays in a rather unbelievable set of circumstances. That is what we're going to explore today. Let's look at the plane, how it was maintained, and how that relates to the accident flight. The air carrier Tuninta was a subsidiary of the largest and national air carrier of the country of Tunisia, Tunis Air. Taking its name from the French translation of Tunis Air Express, the air carrier served as the regional subdivision of the national airline, operating a fleet of smaller aircraft. Among the planes Tuninta operated were the turboprop airliners manufactured by the French company ATR. The ATR 42 and 72 are very similar to each other, the main outward difference being in size. The planes, especially the ATR-72, have been extremely popular with around 1,500 in total built between the two. The accident of discussion today involved the larger ATR-72. Tuninta Flight 1153 was the route between Bari in southern Italy and the Tunisian tourist hotspot of Gerba. On August 6, 2005, the ATR-72 registered as Tango Sierra Lima Bravo Bravo landed in Bari uneventfully. The plane had been making hops over the Mediterranean recently over the past number of days. The captain had also flown the plane the previous day on August 5th. 45-year-old Captain Shafiq Al-Garbi was regarded as a highly proficient pilot. With over 7,000 hours to his name, he had spent most of that time in the cockpit of the ATR planes, effectively becoming a master of the type. The first officer was much younger at 28 years old. Ali Kabir Al-Azwad had around 2,500 hours logged. Like his captain, he too had spent most of his flying career up to that point flying the ATRs. The two pilots that morning on August 6th had flown the accident plane to Bari on a flight from Tunis, but heading back out to Gerba. 35 passengers had boarded flight 1153. Most of them were Italian tourists. In total, accounting for the passengers, pilots and other flight crew members, there were 39 total occupants on board the ATR-72 that day. Among those other flight crew members was a Tuninta engineer. He was officially off duty flying as a passenger. At around 2.30 in the afternoon, flight 1153 left Bari heading southwest. Once flying across the boot of Italy, the plane would be flown over a subdivision of the Mediterranean Sea, known as the Trehenian Sea. This first section of the flight, as the plane climbed up to its cruising altitude of 23,000 feet, went off without any issues. But let us take a step back for a moment and take a closer look at the previous evening before the accident flight. It had became known to the pilots the day before the accident of the poor performance of a specific instrument in the cockpit, that being the Fuel Quantity Indicator, or FQI for short. It does exactly what it sounds like. It simply displays in kilograms the current weight of fuel in the fuel tanks. It uses a series of LED lights to display the numbers accordingly. It is believed that some of these LEDs had failed, leading to readings that were open to being incorrectly interpreted. So, the instrument was replaced that very evening before the accident. A critical mistake took place while this plane was in that maintenance. The Tuninta mechanic was supposed to replace the fuel quantity indicator with either a new instrument or one sourced from another ATR-72. What actually happened instead is that an instrument usually belonging to the shorter ATR-42 plane was installed. The two instruments look basically identical. How this mistake impacted the accident flight is as follows. The fuel quantity indicator interacts with sensors in the plane's fuel tanks. The tanks themselves are located in the wings. The FQI for the ATR-42 is calibrated for that plane's smaller wing and thus smaller fuel tank. This means as though the two plane's instruments are identical, they cannot be interchanged with one another. 
as they are calibrated for different sized fuel tanks. The FQI for the smaller tanks was installed on the plane with the larger tanks, meaning that incorrect information would now be sent to the FQI's displays in the cockpit. The pilots would be none the wiser to this discrepancy, unless they paid very close attention to the small numbering on the FQI itself, which may have been the only clue to the pilots that the wrong instrument was installed. But that is not all. When the replacement FQI was installed, it interpreted the fuel that was already in the plane's tanks to be much higher than it actually was. So when Captain Garby turned up for work that morning, it looked like the plane had been refueled when it actually wasn't. This led to some confusion on the ground in Tunis before the trip to Bari, as official documentation pertaining to the refueling of the plane could not be located, obviously. The airline's dispatch operations allowed the plane to fly anyway. During the turnaround in Bari, the plane was refueled, but still they didn't take on anywhere near the required amount. They left Bari with not even half the fuel they thought they had. Around 50 minutes into flight 1153, whilst cruising on autopilot over the sea, the right side number 2 engine ran out of fuel. In this moment, as the pilots sought to understand what had happened to their engine, they began running through a series of checklists to secure the safety of the plane. This included an attempt to troubleshoot the problem engine and begin a descent to a lower altitude. In this case, an altitude of around 17,000 feet was a more optimum altitude for this plane with just one engine. To the pilots, they had no idea that they had just run out of fuel. The FQI still read that they had more than enough fuel for the trip. Things would go from bad to worse, as it wouldn't even be two minutes before the other engine stopped working. For everyone on board the plane, a nightmare scenario had just unfolded. There was nowhere for the plane to go but down. Planes don't just fall out of the sky when they run out of fuel. Whatever energy the plane already had from its airspeed prior to the engines shutting down can be utilized to glide a plane. If the plane is still moving forward, lift is being generated by the wings, albeit to a much lesser degree. Pilots are trained to achieve the optimum glide path to keep their planes aloft for as long as possible or needed. With no fuel, a plane would weigh lighter than usual and could potentially glide for well over 100 kilometers. That is exactly what happened on August 24, 2001, when an Airbus A330 belonging to the Canadian airline Air Transat glided over 120 kilometers after running out of fuel over the Atlantic Ocean. No one was hurt as the plane did successfully land in the Azores. This was perhaps one of the most famous pieces of flying ever conducted. The pilots of Tuninta 1153 now had to do something similar, but with a smaller plane and nowhere near as much altitude at their disposal. They immediately sought out the most appropriate airport which in this case was the airport at Palermo in Sicily, around 75 miles south of their current position. After running the numbers of their rate of descent and their current altitude, it was calculated they wouldn't make it to Palermo. Going through their checklists, the pilots still had no idea why their engines suddenly stopped working. Captain Garby asked a flight attendant to summon the off-duty engineer to the cockpit. He too could not determine the cause of the problem. The decision was then taken to ditch the plane. This action to ditch the plane would later become controversial for reasons we'll discuss later. Once this was revealed to passengers, according to survivors, panic arose in the cabin. Some passengers apparently even inflated their life vests during this time, going against the safety procedures put in place to keep passengers safe in a ditching scenario. There are multiple reasons as to why passengers are told not to activate flotation devices before leaving the plane. One reason is because it will inhibit movement of the passenger. An inflated life vest on a passenger takes up more space and make it harder for them to navigate the cabin in an escape. Another primary reason is perhaps a bit more scary. If a plane crashes at sea, it is possible that water would flood the plane, causing it to sink. Especially so if the fuselage is substantially damaged. An inflated life vest could force a passenger to the ceiling of a water-filled cabin. That person could then easily become trapped. When coupled with it likely being difficult to remove the vest at this point, it would be highly likely that they would drown here. So don't do it. 
Captain Garby now needed to find a suitable place to ditch his plane. Obviously, it is incredibly difficult to land a plane on water. There is a lot more that a pilot needs to take into account such as the swells of the waves and whether or not they could even be seen. The pilots had noticed boats out on the water around 20 miles north of Palermo. They went about trying to put the plane down nearby as to be seen increasing the possibility of an early rescue response. Air traffic control in Palermo also notified the local coast guard. Boats and helicopters had been sent out before the plane had even hit the water. In the flight's final moments, Captain Garby focused his attention on the water outside and making sure he could land the plane as smooth as possible. When the plane did hit the water though, the fuselage broke at the rear. The tail section sank immediately. The rest of the plane continued over the surface before it dove into the water, with a secondary braking occurring towards the front of the plane, leaving three large distinct pieces of wreckage. The middle section containing the wings did not sink, whereas the nose and tail sections did. The buoyancy of this piece of wreckage would later prove to be a clue into the fact that the fuel tanks were in fact empty. Despite the pilots' efforts to land near the boats, they didn't see them crash into the water. Some passengers survived from being ejected from the plane on impact. Captain Shafiq Al Garbi and First Officer Ali Kabiyeri Al Azwad both survived. One of the plane's flight attendants also survived, whereas the other did not. The off duty engineer was also killed in the crash. 14 other passengers also perished in the disaster, leaving a death toll of 16. For investigators, the fact that both pilots survived was invaluable to the investigation. Both pilots revealed that they thought there was more than enough fuel for the flight and that there was still fuel on board. There were many possible scenarios investigators had to examine, everything from the fuel it did have being potentially contaminated to the failure of the plane's fuel piping. Once the cockpit was salvaged from the sea floor, it was observed that the wrong fuel quantity indicator was installed on the accident plane. The investigation then took a much different turn, as it was found out that the plane simply took off with a lack of fuel for the trip. The captain's decision to ditch the plane came under scrutiny, as evidence began mounting that the pilots might actually have been able to make it to Palermo. Meteorological observations from the day suggest there was a tailwind which could have helped them glide further than normal. The pilot's attempt to glide the plane involved them gliding much faster than the optimum speed they should have to extend the glide. It was also revealed that the pilots did not perform a crucial step in preparing their aircraft. They never feathered their propellers. Feathering propellers on these turboprop planes means changing the angle of the propeller blade into the wind edgewise. It substantially reduces drag, allowing in this case a more optimum glide path. The engines, although running out of fuel, its propellers were still spinning in the wind as it were. The unfeathered propellers acted as a somewhat flat surface, creating a large amount of drag impeding the plane's performance. When taking into account all of these variables, and with reconstructed simulator analysis from other ATR-72 pilots, some believed that actually the pilots of Flight 1153 could have made it to safety. This is all talking from hindsight, however. The pilots may have chosen not to feather the propellers as they didn't think they were out of fuel and so instead of gliding, wanted to try and restart the engines, a procedure which according to their checklists and training did not include feathering their propellers. In the aftermath, the investigation mandated that all ATR-42 and 72 planes are to be checked to see if they are flying with the correct FQI and the necessary information was handed over to the operators across the world. Italian courts brought multiple criminal charges forward against staff at Tuninter, including the mechanic who replaced the plane's FQI. Both pilots were also charged and sentenced to prison, eight years to the first officer and 10 for Captain Garby. These sentences were reduced in 2012. The ATR continues to be one of the most popular regional planes in the world. Its latest variants include an updated flight deck. Airlines across the world continue to place orders for the plane to this day. Hello everyone, thank you so much for watching this video. If you found it to be interesting, be sure to be subscribed as there is always a new video every Saturday.
and have I got a video for you coming next week. I stumbled across a plane crash in my research that has a few words written about it on the entire internet. Literally all internet sources copy and pasted the same three sentences from its Wikipedia article. It required another deeper level of digging newspapers from the time and all that kind of stuff. So that will be out next week and I can't wait to share it with you. Subscribe so you don't miss out on it. Anyway, a big thanks once again to my patrons for the amazing ongoing support to the channel. Their names are scrolling on the screen right now. If you want to support the channel further yourself, you can join the Disaster Breakdown Patreon from just £1 per month and the link to that will be in the pinned comment below. All patrons get early access to all new content two days before it goes out publicly on YouTube. Shout out this week to a new patron, I Found Your Cheetos. Incredible name. With all that said, I think I will end the video here. Thank you all so much for watching, have a good weekend, and I will see you next week. Goodbye!